Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, an oral history podcast about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners. Loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this podcast and just tell me what they do all day and let me record how this affects us. Thank you for listening. What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh God. Uh, Yeah, so I did see the the classes. You would think I would have been some way, you know, prepared. And (laughs) I did think about this. So I I had, I had like, so for context, I I grew up as as a Jehovah's Witness. So I was born as a Jehovah's Witness born into a Jehovah's Witness family. And as a result, if you asked me uh, at the Kingdom Hall what I wanted to be when I grew up, a good a good Jehovah's Witness would have been the uh, the answer. And that eats a lot of your um, mm. desires to do other things. Secretly, mm. of course, I wanted to do anything to do with cats or the outside world or, you know, mm. anything, anything like that, anything to do with the outdoors. But and, and in very short order, I wanted to be a writer. Mm. So I, I used to kind of spontaneously, actually I can't say spontaneously, it sounds like I invented writing. I, I began writing um, without much kind of inspiration by anybody I knew mm. when I was quite young. So, so when I was seven or eight, I think I sort of sat down and went, I'm going to write a, a story now and I'm going to write, mm. you know, a whole book. And I never did, I never finished any. Uh, but then the same with poetry and things like that. I sat down and just started writing uh, poems because I was reading a lot of poems at school. Mm. Um, so I would have very much liked to have been a writer, mm. but the assumption beyond all, you know, behind all that as a good Jehovah's Witness was that I wouldn't be a window cleaner, mm. which is basically what most Jehovah's Witnesses are, including several members of my family, not to, uh, you know, I don't want to diss anybody because, you know, it's a good, good profession. Some of them are really, really advanced, like serious, you know, high level window cleaners. Mm. Uh, but the, the whole point of being a witness is that you're not supposed to you're not supposed to do jobs that take up too much time. And it, it's slightly better, I believe, than what the people I know are still our witnesses tell me, but you also weren't supposed to go to university. You were supposed mm. to drop out at the first available opportunity and become a uh, a pioneer. So somebody who would go door knocking professionally in, on, a, on a scale of kind of 40 hours a week. So yeah, all of those things is probably what I, what, what I, what I wanted to be. It's not what I really wanted to be, but it's what I believed I was going to be, I guess. Mm. Okay. Well, first off, it's a shame this isn't a podcast about Jehovah's Witnesses because there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff there. Um, Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I I would. Yeah, that would be a a very interesting. uh, Yeah, I have a lot of uh, Jehovah's Witness stories and uh, what it's like dealing with with not being a witness anymore, Mm. including um, at... uh, yeah, I stopped being a witness when I was sort of 16, between 15, 16, kind of that age. Mm. And I, uh, and when I was 25, 26, maybe a bit older, there was an earthquake in Huddersfield where I was living at the time, mm. a random earthquake. And it rolled down Manchester Road where I was living and I felt it go through the house. It woke me up mm. and I jumped and ran to the window. And, you know, 10, 15 years after I've stopped being a Jehovah's Witness, I genuinely believed that the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse would mm. be dry, like riding down on Manchester. <laughs> and that was the first thing that came into my head, like real, yeah. oh my God, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. 15 years after I stopped being one. So yeah, that's the uh, the level of, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to think I don't, I'm not hugely affected by it now, but that would probably be a a lie <laughs> so well yeah it's like you can't you can take yourself out of the church but you can't take the church out of you and uh, i have good things i have bad things that are from it yeah, yeah. that'd be a whole other uh, uh podcast yeah yeah i i mean i think it's really interesting that you said that work should be something that's done quickly and you know not not 
too much time spent on it. Yeah. Which, which has kind of become one of my theses from doing this. It's like, mm-hmm. as a climate solution, everybody just work less. You know? <laughs> yes, you know, Spend more time less. thinking, you know, that's, that's work. <laughs> Ah, but capitalism, <laughs> this is the thing, I don't want to get all political so early on, but it's, you know, nobody's capitalist interest for you, for anybody to start work to work less. Mm. Uh, if it were, we all would. Mm. Uh, and then we'd have universal um, income and all of the things that enable all of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, mm. I, I own a, uh, the website becausecapitalism.co.uk mm. and I, I own that. And if you click on becausecapitalism.co.uk, it's a white screen that just says because capitalism. <laughs> Uh, and it, it sets it up because it's easier than having the, the game. It's not conversation. It's like whenever people say, but why is this thing? Yeah, because capitalism is actually mm. nine, 99 times out of 100. The answer is because capitalism. Well, we're going to get into all of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But before we move on, I, I just want to, on the childhood front, a little bit longer. So I would imagine if you're, you know, you're in a kind of, essentially a gated community looking out um you know and things were pretty boring you know in the <laughs> the 80s <laughs> yes, they were. Television, television stopped there were only so many magazines you could buy at a time and they were all black and white and so on and so were you even more bored as a kid was it like i mean or did the church provide you with lots of entertainment and engagement and no, so I, I don't want to talk smack about the Wakefield uh, congregation that I. No, but I'm just trying to put a bit of a. Well, you know, well, like a, a... So some, what I'm saying is some some congregations, yes, yeah, there were looking out at other congregations. There were there were there were other ones that had a whole kind of roster of out of hours activities that people did as a as a group, you know, for fellowship and all that sort of stuff. Um, the congregation I went to was run by horrible old bastards and basically the the people i mean i just swear on this both yeah of course you are oh. <laughs> um yeah there were some really horrible genuinely like awful people who 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 ran it who were just super strict mm. so anything that was like we we used to do swimming and stuff out, out, out of hours uh, and they stopped it stopped us learning to swim as a as a group activity and it was uh it seemed kind of the, that that was the way anything that we did that was um Games fun, that, yes, fun. Basically, <laughs> well, you see, the flip, the flip side of that is, I grew up in a in a a, a very little sort of traditional village outside of Wakefield called Renthorpe, mm. uh, and Renthorpe was even when I was growing up, it was still a that you don't let your dollars, you know, like mm. kids mm. just go out. I used to go out on a day, and my my like traveling radius was about two miles. I used to go to yeah. woods and places like that. There's a woods I used to go to specifically because I knew it had rats in it. I used to go there to look at the rats. Do you know what I mean? And I've got an eight-year-old now, and I'm like, what the world? No, I would not be okay with that, you know? Um, and that was the sort of thing. It was like, you, 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 it was the thing where you would, uh, the light, the street lights would come on, and you would genuinely hear people's mums shouting for kids to come home, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. So I have a... a Yes, it was boring, but I did grow up, grow up in what was one of the last so I discovered. Actually, it was one of the, probably the last like idyllic villages mm. with a community in um, in the area. And we had May Days, and we had a May Queen, and we had mm. you know a, a community. And it was you know sure it was full of all kinds of horrible things going on behind closed doors, but it was mm. pretty cool. As a, as a kid, you could go off to random places. The actual uh, meetings that I went to on the flip side of that was so boring that I ha- I literally went off into a, um, a, uh, a disassociative state to escape. Mm. That's how boring they were. Mm. Um, but the, but the rest of the time, yeah, I was, I was, it was all right. I wasn't so bad. You can't, can't complain. Mm. We have lots of cats as well. So that helped growing. <laughs> You're obviously a cat person then. I am definitely a cat person. We had, um, at one point we had 13 when I was growing up as a wow. kid. Because we had, we had a mother cat and we had three kittens that were born. And by the time we, we, we always used to, she used to have lots of kittens. By the time we got organized to give them away, uh, three of them fell pregnant at the same time. So then we ended up with 13 cats to give away, which I was like a pig in shit for like a period of time. <laughs> covered in, walking everywhere, covered in kittens all the time. So, you know, so that kept, that, that kept me sane. You're listening to Series 4, Episode 10, and to my guest, Dan Akers. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 23rd of March, 2023. So 
I got knocked down, but I got up again. Right then, what do we have this episode? Well, don't let the modest and very short guest introduction that's about to unfold fool you. This is a very rangy conversation. Dan was such an interesting, open and honest person and the whole conversation resonated strongly for me. So then, Dan Akers is a business analyst with 23 years experience as well as the owner of a couple of agencies. He avoids all of that by running events, music, business, food and other random things, by DJing and by spending as much time with his family as he can. To find out more about Dan, go to instagram.com forward slash danzarak, that's D-A-N-Z-A-R-A-K, instagram.com forward slash not a thing events, instagram.com forward slash fresh out the what, so that's W-H-A-T, linkedin.com forward slash I-N forward slash danzarak. Right, let's do this. Episode 90 of Working Hours with Dan Akers. Okay, so we'll jump forward to what are you doing now? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. That's it's a jump, great. isn't it? Uh, take you from one, one mindset to another. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's probably very easier to very quickly run through how I got to where, to where, to do what I am now. I know that's one of the other questions, but it's it probably easy to do it. That yeah, way. Yeah, always, yeah. What I always say to people when they say, you know, what, what do you do? I basically start by saying I have worked in every sector in every capacity as possible to work in pretty much mm. because I started off as a, um, uh, working, you know, like piecework for, for people like Morrison's kind of local people like that. Then I did kind of part-time work. Then I got a full-time job. I did that for about five, six years. Then I switched from full-time work to contracting. So business mm -hmm. analysis contracting. Uh, after that, I went to, uh, I went freelance for a while. Then I went back to working permanent. Then I went back to contracting again. Then I went to freelance and then started my own company. Mm -hmm. And then I've worked multiple, I've run multiple businesses in the last kind of five, six, well, and eight years now, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and also through those businesses, I have worked as a client, as a service provider to, to clients on both sides of the, of the, the kind of wall. I've also done outsource work for, for other businesses. So I've worked in, in, in all of these different web kind of mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. So. I started off as a, um, an admin, basically I started off, well, no, as a strictly speaking, like I said, I started off doing picking and packing for Morrison's and mm. doing bar work and all that sort of stuff. Mm. I got a job typing auto trader in the day when, mm. in the days when auto trader was a thing that got typed. It wasn't that people yeah. could build it in themselves and there were no web forms to fill in. So you got little kitties that you had to type auto trader. So my typing speed was very fast at the time, still pretty fast. Um, and then I switched to doing an admin job. But because I was good at the, I didn't realize at the time what I was good at, but mm. um, I, I switched from doing um, admin work to writing spreadsheets. And then from doing spreadsheets, I found out what databases were and it mm. turned out I'm brilliant at databases. So mm. I basically wrote uh, and, and designed front ends. Mm. But I started building them within the company I was working for, designing databases, building front ends. Mm. Then I switched into the data reporting side, so building data warehouses and things like that's the next step up to where data warehouse where you're doing mm. data imports and things like that. But then throughout that entire period of time, I, I basically at the end of this time I've been working as a database guy, I met a business analyst mm. uh, and she was a, a woman who, this is in early 2000s when people didn't really know what business analysts were, and mm. sure a lot of people don't know really what they do, what they are now, <laughs> but nobody really knew what BA was at the time. And, um, she said, oh, well, I. I said, well, don't you build things? Don't you make things? Don't you, you know, put, put databases together? Don't you do things? She's like, no, I draw pictures of what those things are and I do process flows and I do requirements gathering and I run workshops and all this kind of stuff. And she said, well, you're doing all of these things now. Mm. You're just also building the, the output. Mm. And as soon as I saw what she was doing, I was like, that's what I should be doing. Mm. I should, that's what I want to become. Mm. So I was looking at, lucky enough with the business I was working for that they let me train up as a BN and then. They were unlucky because about five minutes later, I left and became a contract business analyst, earning really good money as a, as a, as a contractor. Mm. Um, and then I was a contract business analyst for all that 
for years and years on and off. And then I switched to working for agencies. So I was a dev manager in an agency for a while, switched back to being a business analyst, was a freelance business analyst for a while. That's not a thing, another way that's, that's not really a job that you can actually, <laughs> I am one now, but you couldn't <laughs> be one 10 years ago when I tried being one the first time around. Yeah. And then switched to running agencies. So basically now I run, currently I run two, this is a long way around to get to where I, to where I am. I run two agencies at the moment. One is a essentially an analysis agency, so a business analysis agency, where I run workshops and requirements gathering with uh, businesses for apps, platforms, business processes, anything you want really. Um, I draw them up, design them, fix cost, and then I have a network of developers and other um, SEO people and people like that, where I take that work out to them mm -hmm. and um, place it with them and connect up clients. Same with uh, I do things like off the shelf. If somebody wants, uh, uh, they, they they do a lot of recruitment. They want an applicant tracking system. I go into market for them. I find I look at the market for applicant tracking systems. I then do the intros to different people. I'm like a middleman for that. And then I bring those people in. Um, so that's one agency. I also, sorry, also in that, that's startling by the way, it's completely startling. Um, I also spend some of my time for that doing one to three day a week type bigger BA projects. So if somebody needs a business analyst in a traditional way, but they don't want to pay the stupid contract rates that I used to get paid, they paid me much less to do what I did before for much more money. Yeah. Um, so I do that two, two, three days a week. And then on the other side of that, during lockdown, all of that kind of dried up um, because there was a lot less projects getting kicked off. But what there was a lot of was um, websites, uh, website builds, e-commerce site builds. So I went mm. back to my agency, my previous dev manager sort of agency stuff. And I started a business called Gold Top, which is um, a traditional, um, but very quite niche um, a web development agency where we do very specific kind of like quite high end, um, e-commerce sites and websites, basically, but it's these mm. web, web builds. And, um, we do, we, we're not scared of doing bespoke integration with different platforms and providers and things like that as well. So we don't, we do, we build everything in WordPress, but the stuff that we build, it, it's integrated with all kinds of other platforms as well. Mm. And yeah, so that takes up probably quite a bit of my time with running those two, but that's not what I do for fun, obviously, and I don't know if you, if that's the question you're asking, but I do a million other things in my spare time, which is the the non work stuff. I mean, as you went through that and that story, a lot of that rang bells with me. Mm -hmm. I think I've worked all over the place in all sorts of different companies and stuff. Um, so part the main reason for that was because I had other priorities. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I'm assuming you mentioned DJing on there earlier, so. Was it the music? Is it the music where you kind of, I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to be a DJ and everything. The career was just to kind of support you on that journey. It was because that was kind of my, my, you know, the story I was telling myself. No, <laughs> there were points. There were points where, where I was still telling myself I, I was actually a, a writer, really. Mm. I was a writer. I had mm. not written. There, were, there was a period of time where I took a year out. I, basically, I'd, I was, I got married very young. And my, uh, I supported my uh, wife at the time when uh, she was going, finishing off university. Mm -hmm. And when she got a full-time job, she said, why don't I take a year, why don't you take a year mm -hmm. and have a go at doing the writing stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, see what you can make of it. So I was like, brilliant. Yeah, I'll not work for a year. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I did arts stuff for a year, did some like poetry. Art stuff. Art stuff. <laughs> did a lot of poetry. Stand up, joined a band that I was in, uh, yeah. like somebody else was starting a band, but I joined, joined a band, carried on doing a lot of stuff, got to the end of that year and just went like, fuck, no, I've done them. Yeah. I haven't written a book. I haven't yeah. written a lot of poetry and I have had a bit of a go at it, but that was like, well, that's, it's, I don't know if it's a Yorkshire thing or a Jehovah's Witness thing, but I, I, I still have that not, not of being allowed to have aspirations thing that, mm -hmm. that Yorkshire people, a lot of Yorkshire people have, mm -hmm. like aspirations, they're not for you. So if you have a go at something and it fails, don't really try again because that was your shot. Yeah. So because um, you're obviously shit at it, so yeah, it's clearly yeah. <laughs> you're and it's not for you, is what it is. I've, I haven't had a lot of conversations about this kind of like what's not identifying things as being for you because mm. they're not dirty or they're not broken or they're not you know like mm. they're not they're pretentious. 
I have a lot of conversations about pretentiousness. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe maybe there's a reason, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I, I had a go at that and then didn't do that. I also um, had a, took a month off work and actually did sit down to have a go and uh, writing a book. I got halfway through the book and then trying to have a part of was pregnant at the end of it. And I was like, I know I was debating whether I could afford to take some more time off work. And then the answer was, no, I absolutely can't. I need to go and save a load of money because we're going to have a, a baby. Um, the other stuff though, the, 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 so the, the, there's never been a plan mm. to, to do another alternate life path. I made my peace with the, the fact that I, that I will do the thing that thankfully pays me pretty well for the stuff that I do now, the businesses that I run, I will just work harder and longer to allow me to do both that and all the extra stuff that I want to do. Mm. made my peace with that this is not and but the the other the flip side of that is all the stuff that i do that is not work work i will never make any money from it in fact it will always cost me money and will be essentially a very well like often occasionally expensive hobby mm. um but i will do it because if i don't i will go insane mm. 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 so there's no there's never been a an alternate life path i've never been a struggling anything else mm. not for I've always been a BA since mm. I decided I was one. It's just, I've had a succession of very involved ex external pastimes, which I've given as much attention as I can afford to with them before my business starts to slip. Mm. Again, there's a couple of things that I'm thinking of in terms of things to look at there. But I'm also debating whether we should go into questions. I mean, like, I think. It seems like you kind of identified the BA as a job role fairly early on. Yeah. Do you think that really helped? And and I suppose, because I'm thinking as well of like, I'm thinking back to points in my working life where I'm kind of like, there are various things as like, you know, booby prize careers, of, mm -hmm. you know, not a filmmaker. Um, yeah. So, and various things I kind of flirted with. And one of the ones was always like, you know, you, because sometimes you're kind of encouraged to think of a step up or just mm. a step across, but then, then you have to think about progression and possibilities for progression as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously with something like business and an business analyst, you have quite a wide scope for growth within that. Yeah. But also within a, also quite, uh, it, it, you, you can, you can, God, I'm trying to say you can expand horizontally and I yeah. horizontally probably like that, uh, you, without needing to become a C you can become a senior business analyst while still doing exactly the same job you were doing before. Yeah. You can given like the biggest project I ever did was, um, the last contract actually I did as a BA before I switched to doing agency stuff. I'd, I'd done so many projects and had so much experience that I got so I got basically uh, the company I was working for at the time, which is a software company, sold its so its university management and schools management software to the New South Wales Education Authority. Mm -hmm. And it was a 15, 20 million pound project um, rolling out this or requirements gathering for um, the project to be for the platform to be deployed in, I think it was 19 universities and two and a half thousand schools, mm -hmm. a lot of sites. Mm -hmm. So they basically made me a lead analyst on that. So I went out to uh, Australia. I, I lived in Sydney for a, for a month, just doing requirements gathering sessions every day, drinking mm -hmm. coffee and all this kind of stuff. They have lovely coffee in, in Sydney. They do. Uh, where um, where were you in Sydney? Just out. I was interest. in. I was on. Pitt, is it Pitt Street Central Business District? Yeah, yeah, right yeah, in the centre. Yeah. Had a had an a, an apartment that they gave me in the centre of town, mm -hmm. and it's like so I could literally from where I was, I could walk out and go anywhere I wanted. Mm. On a weekend, I went on boat rides. I went on long walks. I hired a car. I went out mm. into the middle of nowhere. You know, I've got spiders on my face and all that <laughs> stuff. And, and basically, so I did that with the technical director, came back, had about another three months where they worked out what they were going to do. And then they were like, right, go to Australia and get sign offs. Mm. And I was like, okay. And they were, they said, just go and you go by yourself. So it's like, I'm, I'm sort of lead analyst on about a 15 million pound project that there wasn't above that's the biggest thing I could have done as a contractor mm. above that I would have needed to have been probably permanent BA at some kind of large corporate essentially mm. so I kind of 
maxed out and it ticked a load of boxes. I love the travel side, but it ticked a load of boxes in terms of like the scale of something I could work on. It scratched a load of those itches. And after that, I was like, I'm actually fine working on, you know, uh, 20 grand up to a 250 grand size project. I mean, some of the stuff I'm working on now is multi million sized projects, but mm. they're other people's projects, so, you know, mm. I'm mm. working on them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of hit up a limit. But then the other thing was I'm, I'm very much a family person. So when, when that was just at the time I met my partner, we were together just over 10 years and we, uh, she fell pregnant quite early on. So we've got an, an eight year old now. We've got another one due in two weeks time, which is, uh, she'll be fun. Congratulations. So, thank you very much. So we're, um, and from that point, as soon as that happened, I was like, as soon as I was sat there, like fatherhood. Do you have any kids yourself? No. You I've got a nephew. Same, same with that thing. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I, again, I, I don't know whether this is a universal experience, but after having had a baby, I always say to people, I, I was fundamentally emotionally rewired by having a baby. And well, you yeah, know, you, you were biophysically as well. Like yeah, there's exactly, a, a yeah. biophysical change in you when you see your children. And I was very, very aware of it. But it's like, sit, from that point, I was like, it's just another thing to, to, so I want everything. I want to be able to do all the things I want to do. And it was just another area where I have to work harder in order to fit in all of the things I want to do. Mm. Um, and the, 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 the work, the different businesses that I, that I run, um, are optimized for my benefit of, for not, not so much for money, because there's a point where I, I probably hit the upper limit of what I could achieve from those businesses. Mm. That's not true. I said, I could work a little, I could do a little bit better, yeah, I know what you mean. a little bit more op optimized and probably grow them a bit as they are right now. They're optimized to allow me to do those things and not ha and worry less about money, but also mm -hmm. have a family and also do all the other stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about maximizing what I'm able to do. And everybody's always like, how do you do all the, how do you fit all the things that you do in? And it's like, just work really fucking hard. I'm privileged to be able to work really hard. I have, you know, I have some privilege from the period of time I was born in, but then I didn't go to university. This is, this is the other thing. I, I had this conversation with my partner just the other, the other day that, you know, like if you were born when I was born, so I was born in 76, um, people who didn't go through a massive career change 20 times in their life like I did. Mm. They maximized their privilege. They leveraged their privilege in the best way they possibly could. And they all live in absolutely giant houses now and have, you know, unless they had some kind of major fall off, they have two cars and they go on holiday five times a year and they do all this kind of stuff and they have savings and, you know, they're buying a house for their kids and all this sort of stuff. The reason that that, that should have been me, but and um, even not going to university, they're not going to university, not going to university and still getting to that point. Again, that's privilege of what was going on at that time in the, in the nineties that you could drop out of university because you were doing so many drugs that you couldn't continue doing university and still do really, really well. That was what it was in, you know, in those days, that was the privilege coming out of the nineties. Mm. But, um, all of those people who, who succeeded, I, I dropped up and started again. And as a result, I am bouncing on the edge. I'm still leaving my privilege to a point, but I'm bouncing on the edge of, of where, of, of all of those other people that are a little bit mm. further on from a financial point of view than I am. Mm. But also, I don't really, I, there again, this is privilege talking, but I don't really give a fuck about any of that stuff. So, you know what I mean? If I wanted to stop doing all the other things that I did and see less of my family, I could mm. be earning, uh, you know, nearly millions of pounds if I wanted to. Mm. but I don't care. Mm. Well, you know, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh, those are really good stuff. So I tell them, but no, <laughs> I, would, I would do terrible, non-social, unfriendly things. Whereas instead I'll use the small amount of money that I have, the small amount of disposable income that I have to do as many interesting things for with, with and for other people as I possibly can. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, as much as it's about working hard as well, it's also about good time management. Which yeah, very, as a business, yeah. yeah, as a business analyst, you should be all over anyway, because <laughs> like, yeah. well, your best resource is your time and managing that effectively. And 
Um, I'm, also, I'm also very lucky in that I have um, not a photographic memory, but I have excellent recall. Mm. So I don't, I, I don't need to maintain huge amounts of assets to maintain, to, to, to be fairly successful. Mm. I don't need to maintain. I have a really, really good calendar. If I showed you my calendar, it's insane, but <laughs> I don't have, um, I don't have masses of notebooks full of all the things that I'm doing. I don't have extensive project plans. I, I'm quite free by the fact that thankfully my brain is a well, I go with a well and it usually produces what I need. So mm. when that's set to go, God knows what I'm going to do. Mm. Have you ever had any like, uh, dyslexia testing or anything like that? No, <laughs> I have other, th I have other things, but, um, okay. I'm, I'm, I, I don't believe I'm dyslexic. I don't believe I am. Well, okay. So I'm somewhere on the spectrum, but then. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause uh, that sounds, sounds like a coping mechanism of like just having the memory and putting it all in your head because it's like, I know how to find stuff in my head. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, so that's the thing I've, I've not. So God, how do you want to get this? Um, it's up to you. I mean, we don't have to go any further along. Well, no, this. I'm, 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 curious. I'm totally, uh, <clears throat> so, so, so basically I, um, I believe, and again, I'm, I've only just recently started to think this way and therefore I haven't actually gone and got a diagnosis. Um, I believe that I have or had, uh, that I, um, uh, borderline personality disorder mm. because essentially, um, the, firstly, the, the criteria or the, the, the background to, to BPD is on the, there's so many Jehovah's Witnesses who were, uh, who are diagnosed as, um, borderline personality disorder. Mm. Um, the ways that, that I used to be from being kind of 16 on was, I was, uh, I was not a particularly great person. So I was super needy. Mm. I was super, I was kind of abusive, controlling, manipulative, not a very good, I was great fun to be around, hey, you know, most of the time, but, <laughs> but not a great person to be in a relationship with. That's, that's the worst thing. I was very controlling mm. and to the point of not allowing people I was in a relationship with to go out of the house and things like that. That's how, that's the level that it was at. And also, um, the, the same time when my, uh, I said I got married very young, I didn't treat my, um, wife particularly well. And I met somebody else. I didn't pound us now, but I met somebody else and decided I was going to leave my, my marriage of nine years to start seeing another person. And, um, so I was a bit, so I, like I said, I didn't have enough flair, but I managed, but but it, it kind of didn't matter because the, the time, but I was basically like, I'm doing the right thing here. So I'm telling you that I've, I've met somebody else. So we're going to stop now. Okay. Bye. See you later. Mm -hmm. And just like immediately went off and pursued a relationship in, in quite a distressing and hurtful way. Mm -hmm. And I went through on uh, uh, following on from that. I basically was like, how can I be what I think of as a nice person? And yet at the same time, how can I be so hurtful mm -hmm. and you know, so what, so unhappy with things. So I went through counseling, extensive counseling for about mm. three, four years, a lot of EMDR, which is, um, an, a great it, counseling for that light thing. Yeah. So I did the yeah. version where you can do it with lights, so you can do it with uh, headphones with beeps in either side, or you can do it with vibrating pads, which vibrate mm. in each hand. Mm. And I went through that and it was like being reprogrammed. It was mm. insane. like being in the matrix. It, it opened up all these kind of pathways to the old version of, of me to when I was a child and it basically allowed me to cut myself a lot of slack about why I was the way that I was because some stuff was pretty hard when I was when I was a kid and you know, things were not not great and um so following on from that I was a much better person I wasn't perfect and I'm not you know no one's perfect I'm not perfect, mm. but I was a much better person following on from that and uh I assumed that all of that stuff was solved by the EMDR stuff but then I also have quite extreme responses still to, um, other people's behavior. I'm very aware of, um, almost like psychically aware of people's emotional views and body language and things like that. I can look around the room and like, yeah, feel, and know what everyone in the room's thinking yeah, uh, and feeling. Yeah. So, uh, and then I was randomly reading, I was reading about a film, I can't remember what film it was, where the lead character had borderline personality disorder. And I was like, oh, oh, I don't even know what that is. This was like about a year ago and I clicked on it and, um, I just burst into tears reading the description of borderline personalities. I was like, that is, that, that's the only, like I've, I've done all, uh, all those like autism surveys and ADHD survey and all the things that, you know, the questionnaires that people mm -hmm. do to see whether to self-identify. 
none of them really sat well. Yeah. And then I did the same thing for BPD and I was like, yeah, that's basically, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's basically me. Hmm. So I can't remember what the initial question was. <laughs> it's really up top, right? uh, well, I was just saying, I think it was about, it was about dyslexia and then we went oh, on yeah, the, yes, like yes, a neurodivergent yeah. pathway. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. am, but I don't think I'm one of those popular ones. <laughs> like you think, do you know what I mean? Like that every night I say that in a, Fairly blase way because <laughs> so many of my friends have, have gone through the diagnosis process. Yeah. Most of my friends are either autistic or they have ADHD and some kind yeah. of way. It's like, they're all like, oh, you should go for that. I'm like, oh, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, but also I, I don't, I don't think that's exactly me. Yeah. And then I've looked at this stuff and I'm like, great. I kind of feel like I know what I am, but it's like, I'm not going to go on Facebook and go, Hey, I've just had my yeah. kind of a dick, like, you know, like <laughs> diagnosis, you know what I mean? Not but would you other... would you go back to therapy with that, for example, and be like, "I'm this," or "Is this me?" Would, would, yeah. would you want the diagnosis? Is what yeah. I'm asking. <laughs> so this this is this is where my own hypocrisy comes back to bite me in the ass, as it always does. So I've been kind of like a bit, I don't know, quite dismissive about the stuff that people that my friends have gone through going through a diagnosis. I'm always a bit like, "Well, that's fine for you, but I don't really see the point." If it was me, I wouldn't get a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as soon as I found out about this, I was like, as soon as I started to feel like this, I was like, shit, actually, it would be quite nice to fight to go. This is why you are you, the things that you struggle with when on, when by most people's, not most people's measures, I don't want to sound like a dick again, but like by a lot of people's measures, a lot of people would look at me and say, oh, you've done really well. You're doing really well. You're mm -hmm. working really well in all these different ways. And, um, also. You're, you're really outgoing and you do all this stuff where you stand up in front of people and you sing and you talk and you run rooms full of people and all this kind of stuff. And you must be, you know, really sorted on the inside. It's like, I am, but there's also 20% um, of me that is absolutely devastated. Mm. Good example, right? Somebody, a, a friend of mine once said that I uh, cut garlic in, a, in, a, in the wrong way or in a basic way. I squash garlic in the wrong way. I still think about that every single time I cut garlic. Mm. Every single time. And that's what it's like. It's like, I can be, I can be all this kind of stuff, but I'm always going to be that guy who cuts garlic wrong. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the thing. So, so the, the reason that I, um, that the reason that I would go back and get a diagnosis, the reason that I would go back and talk, do counseling again is partly because it's optimization again. Because I believe that I, I always believe, again, this might be part of it, I don't know, but I always believe that I could do more and I could do better and be more efficient and achieve more things. Mm. Not in a, I have to prove it to everybody sort of way though. I'm sure there's some kind of secret approval thing going on, you know, under the hood there. But I'm pretty sure that if I was to, to EMDR, because EMDR is a great treatment, by the way, for so, uh, borderline personality disorder. If I was to unpick some of the things that make everything exhausting to deal with, that's, that's the, the thing that, the, 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 that I would be able to go for more things. I would be able to, um, risk, take more risks and I'm pretty risk averse anyway, but like, mm -hmm. I'm, I never feel like, um, I feel like I, 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 but I'm limited by the, the cycles that go on in my brain. So when I come to mm -hmm. think about something. And I've only just recently become aware of this because of the BPD stuff, because of what I've been reading about it. Mm. I will think, for example, wouldn't it be cool if I could go DJ at that particular place? Mm -hmm. And in, in very short order, like within milliseconds, my brain will say to me, you can't go and do that because you're not a proper DJ. And also if you did, you don't use the right equipment. So they wouldn't want to move stuff around for you. You'd kind of be an inconvenience. Also, even if they did let you do DJ there. There would be letting you DJ there because it's free, it, because they're doing you a favor because of mate, because of a mate, you know, mm -hmm. and actually people who came to see you would also be doing the same thing where they'd be kind of like humoring you because actually you're terrible at this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's probably a good reason why you wouldn't, you shouldn't bother asking mm -hmm. that's little cycle can happen in, mm -hmm. I could say three, four seconds mm -hmm. in my brain mm -hmm. that happens with everything I think about. It's like, why wouldn't you do that? Here's 10 reasons why you wouldn't do that. And then I'll go and do it anyway. Mm. If I, but if I could take that overhead, I'm sure I could be more efficient. You know, I could actually, and also less tired. Like I could go and do things without 
having to also manage the overhead of, of thinking negatively about it all the time. Mm. That's where I am. But there's also an element that that negative thought path, that's, that's protective. That's, that's Mm. like danger, danger, you know, like, it's just a warning sign of like, Oh, do you really want to do that? And think about it before you proceed. Kind of thing. But, I mean, you must have had it and overcome it. There must have been time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's that, that's the thing. So I did, the, the thing is, it's not like, um, you know, uh, internalization. So people who really struggle to internalize their, um, their self-belief. Mm-hmm. I, some days in the week, yeah, mostly I'm pretty cool with who I am. I do all kinds of shit. You know what I mean? I'm, I've done all kinds of great stuff and I love talking about it and I'm totally happy with it. And I think I'm probably, I'm the right person for the job and all this kind of stuff. So I don't really struggle with that. That it's just it's it's like that, but it's a, it's a microscopic version of that. That is like a, it's like a you know on your computer a task manager. You're like, why is my computer running slow? And you go on, and it's like, why is Chrome leaking in the background? Or why has he got like If I could just get rid of that that memory leak off to one mm. side, mm. I'd be a lot more uh, efficient and effective, and I wouldn't be so tired all the time. That's kind of, that's kind of what it was for, but I still do all the things. I do the things. So, but you're a man, not a machine. God damn it. It's a a man, not a Google brand. Fucking Chrome browser. No. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go into questions. Um, uh, I'm kind of like, I'm not really interested in them now. I'm more interested in random tangents. That's what you like. As you you can probably tell that I don't, the, the other thing is, and I get this from my mother. I have, I am born without pride. Um, I have no pride. And as a result, I'll say anything to anybody. I don't really care. I don't know. That might be a Yorkshire thing. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, I have no pride. So ask me anything. I'm not, I am not ashamed. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll kick off. We'll, we'll go into COVID. We'll start with COVID. Yes. Uh, so I want you to think back into locking down or, you know, whether you had an office or whatever was going Mm. on at the time. So I want you to think about sort of your work rate as we first locked down, mm. um, what your kind of work-life balance was like, what what the work was like, or if the work was there or it just all disappeared and kind of what what are the long-term changes for you coming out of it? I mean, has it, do you think it's changed anything permanently for you? Yeah, I do. I do. So I, I locked down um, two weeks or three weeks before most people I know, I'm not being hip. I wasn't like a COVID hipster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I locked down early because I'd the year before I'd had double pneumonia from nothing. I'd had a cold and I had a double pneumonia. I, I was like, Where, where's my back hurt? And I'd gone in and it was like, this cold's been going on for months. It's like, oh yeah, it's, you've got double pneumonia, double pneumonia. And I have poor, uh, respiratory stuff anyway, most of the time. So I was worried that if I got COVID, it would kill me in short order. Yeah. So I immediately, um, I, I locked down. I had these conversations with people. I was like, I'm just not going to, I just can't do this anymore. I did like, after that, I did one meeting and it felt off. Mm-hmm. Um, I switched from basically working out of co-working spaces in Leeds to working from home, which was a massive hardship. My partner, immediately they locked, she locked down as well. So she was working from home. Um, and like immediately. I was one of those people, again, this is a privileged thing again, but because we had a, a couple of workable spaces, like I have an, an office, my partner works out of the spare room upstairs, mm. uh, life got loaded better during, during mm. lockdown. It was a bit scary for a while, but we, we were very lucky. Somebody put on a face on a local Facebook group. Oh, the, so, some guys from the markets, so there was a butcher, a grocer, a baker at a candlestick, maker, no, like a, a pet, a pet food stall. Had all got together, decided they were good, with the florist who had the van mm. to do uh, food deliveries, and you mm. could order via a, a Facebook Messenger. Mm-hmm. So we started doing that. We we were never out of food. We, in fact, the quality of what we were eating went up so much during lockdown. We were like mm. better quality food, more time, no mute, mm-hmm. um, more community stuff. I, all the stuff events that I was running switched nice seamlessly online, which is great. Less noise, better air. Yeah, ex- exactly. All this kind of, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, it was great. And, um, uh, the, the, I lost a couple of projects. That was the, 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 the biggest impact was the, from a fight, from a risk or sort of worry point of view was 
a couple of bigger projects that were in my cash flow for the next, that were part a big chunk of my cash flow for the next six to 12 months mm. died because of COVID. Mm. Um, and so as a result, I was scratching around for work for a little bit, but like I say, I just, st I started another business, I basically started doing more websites. And then we, um, and then me and my long-term collaborator, who's also now the business, the co-owner of Gold Top, we just, we started a, a, a web development business because I had the skills and we, he had, he's a designer. We started using a really great set of tools that we were using before. And, and we, loads of people needed it as well. Because they were all like, oh God, we haven't got, we, we only did, you know, we never did a website. Now we need one. Exactly. Yeah. So I can't, but that, that bottomed everything out, started off building like websites for a grand. And then by the end of it, we were building websites for like 40 grand and like, you know, really high end, more high end stuff. And that's kind of where we're at. We're between the 10 and 40 K hmm. build mark. Now, usually we don't do much that's less than that. Though we are bits at the moment doing some slightly lower ones. I also did a, a I started a, another, <laughs> started another project during lockdown uh, called Nia, which is a website basically connecting people up, not to the what Google said they should be uh, when they're searching for stuff rather than serving the sponsored results, it served the nearest results, the geographically nearest results. Mm -hmm. So it was listings for place for anything you might want to buy. What's the nearest version rather than the Google list version. Yeah. Yeah. So that didn't work, but I did, I did that for a while. That was quite, that was quite fun. Paid, paid, somebody sponsored me to pay to do that, which was quite nice, but never again, it was a side project and, uh, uh yeah, so it was fine. And then coming out of, uh, lockdown, it just went back to being what it was before, except I now work from home. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, it had, I was lucky to say it had a very little impact on, on me. I, I was lucky. Nobody in my family was hugely adversely affected by it. Mm -hmm. Um, we've all had it. None of us were, you know, horrifyingly ill. I didn't get long COVID. Um, I don't know people who have, and it's awful. So yeah, did all right. Really did. Okay. I mean, like what was your. So if, I, I mean, I, the difficulty with lockdown was because it was so fucking long. You know, there's not like on. an overriding trend. Everybody went through everything through that period because yeah. that was such a long period of time, you know, births, marriages, deaths, whatever. But like your kind of sense of that period, like, I mean, obviously locking down early, uh, obviously you mentioned you were working in co-working spaces. So yeah. uh, the event you, stopped. you're the already doing... Events. Yeah, but you're already doing remote work and kind of yeah, yeah. connecting with people remotely. So none of that's really a change for you. No, I actually work now with more people further uh, further afield than I do uh, that I did before. I was working yeah. with primarily leads in a local area of businesses and I work right. with businesses. I was in Alabama last like a few months back. The the thing that was that was most well, the the feel of it, as you know, I sort of grew up in like a little quiet mm -hmm. village. Mm -hmm. Just like that again. And actually the community, the local community stuff where I, where I live in Huddersfield, there's no, um, there, there wasn't a massive amount of kind of community stuff going on. It's kind of a little back, backwater community. We don't even have a shop. Do you know what I mean? There is a shop, but we do it's miles away. It's a nicer. So we're not, none of these like cool villages where you've got a little brewery in a artisan bakery mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. fairly, it's very pretty, but kind of fairly empty village mm -hmm. because of COVID the when we were coming out of COVID, the scouts became a massive thing. Everybody's kids in the village all joined the scouts, the cubs and the beavers and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And that really helped with the community side. They re uh, they got grants to redo the like the wreck area up at the top. So all of that was done over. Mm -hmm. Actually, the community improved mm. because of the energy being temporarily focused inwards on the on the uh, the village, mm -hmm. and it made it more like being an actual village again which mm. was crazy. It, it grew community. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a lot of changes coming out of that, that, um, yeah, yeah, like this, it'll take years to work out. Yeah. Yeah, it will. Yeah. And I think people are the, the, the thing that was that, that I think people are still bouncing back from is the homeworking side in villages. People, the fact that actually the people's priorities changed about housing and you know, what, what's actually what, what now a good house for somebody who, who needs to work from home includes a, a, an additional reception room, not doing anything, you know, mm. so all of that stuff ch change. I think people will, 
be looking for spaces that are more like that. I'm on a website called Spread Other Projects uh, called um, uh, Local <laughs> Spaces. Um, and it's all about that. It's about finding spaces, co-working spaces, things like that. And community spaces are one of the least recognized and least well-supported areas of, of community. Um, little rooms in the back of churches and rooms above hairdressers and all those things, rooms where you don't have to pay to exist, spaces like that. They are there. What's going to be important that dead, that supposedly dead space in communities is what's going to be, that's going to be important over the next 10, 20 years. Mm. Well, we had a, a lesson in, um, capacity and keeping some surplus to hand, didn't we really? We did. Yeah. Temporarily, yeah. Um, supply chains and why they're stupid. Yes. Yeah. And, um, why they have no real viability in the long term. Yeah, just in, exactly. <laughs> the whole just in time thing that was, was it definitely Toyota in a bit of just in time where it's all like, we don't need to keep stock mm. because the guy who's at, who has the stock or has the next thing, he's only five minutes away and he's willing to bring it around. It's like, mm. yeah, so nobody has anything anymore. So mm. because captures. Yep. So when you suddenly need loads of ventilators, you screw it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The lead <laughs> time is, yeah, is <laughs> yeah, restricted. Uh, so yeah, I want to get a sense of like, how scared were you through that then with the, the sort of locking down early? Did you feel quite confident in, and was the vaccine a big relief? Was it, or were you just, did you throw yourself into work and then go, oh, I'm working too much or did you just kind of take it in your stride? Was it? It wasn't bad. I was, I was scared early on. I was really scared. Like I say, from a health point of view, the vaccine was a massive relief. Um, the, um, but then again, hypocrisy, I, I locked down early than other people, but then also I got, I got to a point where I felt comfortable again, post vaccine, but I got to a point where I felt comfortable getting back out, out mm. into the world sooner than most of my friends as well. Mm. And actually it was, a it, it was a weird time from a, from a personal relations point of view around, you know, what your beliefs were, mm. it suddenly was at like. In the early days of COVID, it's like, what are you going up for? That's stupid. You know, why, why are you going out and taking all these risks? Mm. And then it's like, why are you staying in for? It's stupid. Mm. You don't need to risk, you know? And it's, it's always a, it, there was a real kind of rubber band like style bounce back uh, on that. And I'm very lucky in some ways because I was pushing to get back out there and I, and I tried running events early on, like physical events. Mm. And it's, it's only now that things are, are starting to kind of come back. And even now, I think it's things have changed. Things have been forever affected with it by the the way that people look at what those activities are that they do is different. It, it's people's perceptions of, oh, I'm just going to fill my time up, you know, and do a thing. I think people are slightly more careful with their time, and also because everybody's time with the cost of living crisis and everything else is suddenly being squeezed, like you know, in, in much harder than it ever has been. So yeah, uh, it was a, it's a weird time. Mm, mm. Great way to kick off the decade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I think we've been pretty comprehensive on COVID there. Um, anything that you want to add before we move on to that from that? No, I'm just can't think of anything COVID specifically. Like I say, it was, I was lucky. I'm pretty sure had I gone through some of the, ex through the, an experience like some of my friends did with seeing loved ones die in hospital um, are experiencing that, that I would have a very different view on it. And I'm very lucky and again, privileged that I have a, that we had a, you know, I live in a massive house, but our house is big enough to sustain two separate working spaces. So we could basically do homeschooling and things like that. So yeah, there was, there's a, again, I'm, I'm, I know it's, I was joking to a point when I'm saying about like leaving your, pri your privilege, you know, to get to that point. I did it just enough to that I live in an all right house, but you know, I know I live in a quiet, small area, mm. um, but it means I've got space where, I, where we can exist and um, when we need, when we're not allowed to leave the house for two years, you know, that's all. I mean, the thing I don't like about that whole sort of like, I get it. I get the whole privilege thing, but the thing mm. I don't like about it is this kind of, oh, uh, you know, like I've got a decent standard of living and, and I should be super grateful for that. No, yeah. everybody should have a decent standard of living. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the other, we're all, we've also all got to be like, oh, yes, well, I'm so grateful for what I do have. There's people jotting off into space, you know, and not giving yeah, yeah. about yeah. anything. You're always somewhere on that, on that 
uh, level. And the, the things as well, the things that privilege privilege buys you, it's very easy again to say, oh, you know, they're not they're not the right things, but the things that the privilege gets you, I, a lot of them I would happily swap for everybody having other things, if you know what I mean, other better ways of living. I would happily swap any of my bits of privilege for something else, as long as I'm not starving, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you've got your, your, your basic things, whatever they are, you know, whether that's a nice comfy chair and your TV or, you know, yeah. your shed and... Uh, oh, I love a shed. Yes. I have a green house instead, so that's, that's kind of the same. I'm just... What should we do? Let's do Brexit. So question here is, uh, again, basically the same. Has it affected your work? If so, how? It hasn't affected my work. It has affected the work of a number of my clients who used to sell happily from the UK into the EU and that market has just gone and closed to them in a lot of ways. So it screwed those guys over. I have not been traveling much in the last few years, apart from going to like say, getting off to Alabama, which is quite nice. We, we've, we've done mostly UK holidays since Brexit. And so because we were not tra- haven't been traveling those, I haven't seen the effect of it going into Europe, particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, most of my business was done with UK companies anyway, or via third parties to other countries in the world. So it's not, it's not had a huge effect on me. Uh, the flip side, obviously, of that is I think it's fucking despicable and stupid. But you know that's that's my personal belief in terms of how it affects me. Mm. Well, that much everything's gone up in price. Um, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. I do, I do okay. With, uh, the the point when the supermarkets were supposed to be empty of veg, mm. we buy all our veg from my local um, Asian supermarket. Mm. There's loads of veg in there. It depends what you depends what you're willing to eat. Really, we ate a lot of um, sag. A lot of spinach, a lot of mm-hmm. um, greens, and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. I, again, I don't want to be flippant because there are people who uh, whose businesses have been absolutely destroyed by it, and who are living, you know, who, who are struggling because of the direct effects of it. But I, mm-hmm. we we do okay. Yeah. I'd love to it to be reversed, and it pisses me off that um, Rishi Sunak is currently kind of backing away from the the most extreme side of it, you know, ready to do deals again and all that sort of stuff. And that's kind of like, you know, come on guys, could have been, this This could have been, uh, everything could have been avoided. It's like, yeah, anyway, yeah, I, I do okay from, uh, because, in spite of this. Mm. Uh, I'm going to leave that there because I think if I open that any further, we'll, we'll be going ages on that. Yeah, there's um, some anger involved, yeah. <laughs> but it's always there. I, it's always the question where people kind of get a bit more, Normally have a bit more to say, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm about as left wing as it's possible to be. I think is uh, in spite of all the capitalist things that I do and running multiple businesses and all that sort of stuff. I'm, you know, m- morally I'm about as left wing as uh, as can be. So, yeah, I, yeah, I have more to say about it. So, yeah. Okay, so let's do social media first because I think that will be interesting. Okay. To get your take on. So what I want to look at here is, so all these questions kind of came out of discussions that I was having with people around work and they kind of seemed to be the areas that we kind of ended on. And my thinking was that more and more people are doing more and more social media work, which involves like filming, editing, image creation, image editing, uh, graphic design, all of these like, you know, visual media. Um, and you know, the same way that we all became, we all started knowing a hell of a lot more about the printing industry than we ever knew before in the last few decades, mm-hmm. you know, like how many people knew any different type font names <laughs> and all of these things before. Yeah. Um, now everybody's becoming, you know, filmmakers and media creators mm-hmm. and so on. And even if you're not creating it for yourself in your role, you're quite often tapped to do it, you know, like the boss wants all the bar staff to do a dance or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um for you, how much time do you spend on it? And uh, do you see a good return on investment of that time? Like, can you tangibly see the results of, I do X and I get Y result? Um, so I, I was working in an agency in 2010 when all the social media stuff came on. And it was like, the joke was you joined the agency and you surrendered your social media accounts to the agency because they all wanted you to be, it was, you, you know, 
Make sure you're using your Facebook account to talk yeah. about work and your Twitter account. Over there. Make it look organic. Yeah, and I never did any of that shit. I absolutely backed off. In fact, after I left um, the agency I was working for, I went back into contracting. I made a, a decision not to add anybody who I worked with in the new place I was working on my social media so I could talk smack about work. Mm. And it was such a freeing like thing, being able to just talk, you know, talk whatever. But I'm done. I'm done with Facebook apart from I put silly things on, you know, silly thoughts on Facebook for uh, friends and lots of people I don't know. Um, so Facebook's kind of a dead thing, except for I run ads on Facebook. I run ads on Facebook for events and also for, and also on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I have, so because of the events, so I basically, I, I did a, a big tidy. Again, this is an optimization organization thing again. I did a big tidy about, God, about eight months ago, I think it was now, of all of my different social media channels because I had loads of different pages and things. Mm -hmm. And I kind of brought them into three different uh, three different channels, which, are, which is what I've got. So I've got my personal one, I've got Danzarak, which is my main, my main Instagram channel and my main Facebook place. I've then got one for, for all of my non-DJing events. So not a thing with my events company where I do all the random stuff. And then I have the one specifically for sharing the DJ mixes that I do and talking about any of the other DJ, the, the fancy DJing stuff, which is fresh out of what, which is what I've been doing for sort of 10 years of brand new music stuff, like literally music released in the last 30 days. So on all of those channels, I keep them nice and tidy and I keep all my stuff uh, separate. So I have, have like, so I have like odd and organized, tidy stuff. Um, and it's a bit like the events things. It's like, I'll, I'll. I'll get a, an idea about a particular event that I want to run. And then I'll, be, because of the industry I work in, because of the, I have friends who are designers and, you know, because I have all of the access to all of the, like all the creative cloud and everything else to, mm. to work. So I've got Premiere and I've got After Effects and all that sort of stuff. I've got a lot of tools and I do love stuff. I, I use Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects, Premiere, Audition, uh, Adobe XD, all, all the, like, almost the complete suite, basically. I can use them all. So as a result, I can use those amazingly fantastic tools to do some really basic things on social, on social media, which is kind of <laughs> what I do. So I do, um, in terms of how much I use it, I, I do, um, events, I dance, I do motion design stuff for events that I'm running. Basically some fancy, fancier stuff than you would see on most people's DIY. 30, 40 people turn up at your event type stuff. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of kind of fancy stuff. But it doesn't really cost me anything because I'm doing it through work. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and actually, most of the events that I run, actually, they go through work, mm -hmm. I, which means I pay VAT on them. And all the things that I pay out, I, you know, I, they're not like, a, it's not a, um, you know, it's not like, a, oh, here's a scam to get stuff out of work. I run events through work because I also run business mm -hmm. events through my, through my work as well. Mm -hmm. So I have all the tools to do all this kind of stuff. It's... Creating video assets and moving picture stuff makes me happier than almost anything else that I do. I enjoy it so much. I will sit and spend hours tweaking a ball on something so that it moves in a smooth way, all that sort of stuff. Um, the only thing I enjoy more in terms of, from a work point of view, is DJing. And I will happily sit in, in, a, in a room for no money and play music to no people for as long as you possibly might want, because I absolutely <laughs> love it. it. Ticks some kind of massive box inside of me. So, um, yeah. So in terms of use, usage of social media, quite a bit. Now have a look on my social media channels. I have, I have a lot of stuff. Mm. And they will all be in the show notes. That's hey, that's me good. being podcastery there. And uh, I'm quite, the thing is as well, I'm quite like, I'm cynical about Facebook, but at the same time, I'm post cynical about Facebook. Again, I don't want to be a hipster about this sales thing, but I'm kind of like, it's shit. I get it, but it's where a lot of people are mm. still, and I'm I'm all right with it. Mm. I'm not spending so much like much television. Money. A bit like yeah, I'm post television. <laughs> well, yeah, don't watch, don't watch television anymore. Um, and switch to what again during lockdown, switch to watching YouTube as television. So now I use, have YouTube subscriptions mm. instead of TV programs, and so yeah, I'm much happier. Again, I haven't watched the domestic TV in a very well. Long you're paying time. for it, so you don't get the adverts. So yeah, that would make you happier. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm paying the I'm paying the thing. So, but yeah, the um, so the this but the social stuff that I that I do, I'm not, 
I'm not cynical about, about it. I'm not even cynical about Chinese mastermind and TikTok. I don't give a fuck. It's like, if people want to do silly stuff to make themselves happy, I don't really care. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, I, I don't want you, I don't want everybody's brain to rot. But at the end of the day, I've rotted my brain. When I was a kid, I, I, I would have spent the entire day on my computer if I could. I'm dead. Mm-hmm. And I'm all right. Do Which you know, you're still kind of doing in a way, but you're doing well, yeah. legitimate things now. Yeah, some, sometimes, <laughs> at least partially for money now, so that, that helps. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah no, that, but I'm not, I don't, the, the other thing that, I, this is a big overarching thing of me, is that I, again, as well as not being proud, I am not particularly sentimental about anything. I like old stuff. I run, for example, I did a um, a very niche couple of nights which i'd love to i'm hoping to do another one again this year called munster mid 90s small town mm. rock night you mm. basically the equivalent of the clubs i used to go to in the 90s which was mm. from a town in wakefield that was not big enough to have it was big enough to have a bar for rock and a bar for indie mm. but it wasn't big enough to have two club nights so it had one club night that was an awkward mix of, rock, of metal and indie and so you'd have mm. like Stone Roses, and then you'd have Slayer on straight after. Mm. So um, I did a night that was that, and you could say that was sentimentality. But I don't, generally speaking, I am I, I, I love new things, brand new things. I'm I'm like it's almost a compulsion, I would say. But the music stuff that I that I do, where I do the DJ mixes, it's literally music that came out in the last seven days. So I'm literally mm. buying brand new music, mm. and I want to be involved in new things and things with younger people as well who are by default the newest to the new um and as a result that's that's like it it, it drives me and it from a um and and i am always frustrated by people who got all the music they were ever going to listen to by the time they were 27 mm. it's like, well, i've got my music now so i don't need to listen to anything else mm. or um, nights where and i do a few of these nights where everything every bit of music that we do is 70s 80s maybe 90s mm. The, the, uh, there's a, I actually think it's a bit, it's borderline being a problem in society because it's splitting the generation that we've yeah. got, the generation who don't give a fuck about any of that stuff. Yeah. It just makes everybody like, I don't know. Just, just play, different. yeah, just play good music stuff. Why does everything have to be a school fucking class? Like everyone has to be organized all the time in their year of manufacture. Like, oh, we yeah. all, we're all this age, let's all do this thing. And there's, there's a real, when you don't, <laughs> When you are, if you're an older person who gets into younger stuff, you are like programmed by older people to think of yourself as kind of weird and pathetic. Yeah. And actually what I've found universally is like I, um, I'm doing a, 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 a night at the moment that I'm doing every, every month at Celebrant called Put Yourself Out There. Mm-hmm. And it's mostly at the moment bands who are coming from Leeds Conservatoire, so Leeds Music College. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're all what 19 20 21 you know that's not age thing and actually apart from walking in and being like who's this whole fucking like when when, when over the nights everybody's perfectly nice and like we all have a chat about stuff we're all in, into things and i find about new bands from from them and then i play maybe some slightly older stuff and people ask me what i'm playing mm. and it's like it's never it's not at any time felt weird mm. to be a 46 year old guy putting a night over for people who are have, have your age because mm. What am I doing it for the sake of, I want to, I want to hear that music. I want to hear what the new stuff is. Yeah. Know? And so do other people. Yeah. It's yeah. that, and this, it's, yeah, it's weird because it's brought, it's definitely like, a, what are you hanging out? What are you doing that for? It's like, you know, you're putting on your, your young person clothes. It's like, no, I'm putting on my old fucking clothes and going in a room full of people are dressed in a different way. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I am, I, I am very simpatico with all of that idea, but at the same time, I would also really, really like to have one good like nineties noughties club night was an, <laughs> just that was way. over forties only. Just oh, so you could have, <laughs> like no selfies, no people like, you know, just old school people dancing and chewing their face off, you know? <laughs> this will be this will be nice. I think as well, I do think there's a there's an argument for older things. Well, did I see him the other day say do a man and they I was um je- uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, she she mm. won an Oscar, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is great. Fun. Um, she when they were interviewing afterwards, what was she saying? She was saying like, I like old people music. I like Bruce Springsteen. I like you know. Mm. And then she's like, Bruce, do a fucking matinee show. Yeah, yeah. two o'clock in the afternoon show. 
Yeah. And then I'll go do it and then I'll go home and I'll put my kids to bed. And it's like, yeah, that sounds like actually that sounds like a very sensible idea, Jagger really, Yes. Yeah. And and plus there's loads of benefits because, you know, like from your carbon literacy and stuff, like one of your mm-hmm. biggest contributors is all the people coming to see your show. And yeah, if you can yeah. put them on buses, but your buses generally stop when work stops. Because true, true, like, true. Or you can have three. You can have three this evening. <laughs> Yeah, and they all get back before you. They all finish before the thing that you're doing in town finishes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A bit. Yeah, I do feel really bad. The nights I do, there's a the guy who lives the other side of where I live, Richard so Halifax, and it's now almost impossible for him to come to a night in Leeds. Mm. And it's like we finish at like quarter past ten. It's like yes, still, still, I would have to leave at half night. Mm. So, yeah. That doesn't help anything growth-wise, does it? No, it's not ideal. Uh, okay, so let's do climate change, and then we can go on to the kind of more fun questions. <laughs> uh, so climate change front, basically what I want to look at here is not so much how it's affected you, although if it has, like, for example, last year, hottest, hottest day or mm-hmm. anything else uh, temperature-wise that's been disrupted. But, yeah, how... How do you think about it work-wise? Is there anything in your work that you can do? Do you do anything work-wise to sort of deal with climate change? I have a, a couple of clients who do, but no, I, there's very little that I do apart from I don't I hardly travel a, at all uh, anymore. So we do a lot of remote stuff, um, a lot of remote working. I, but in, in terms in work terms, no, I, I don't, and I don't. We, you know, we do. Um, Probably like the minimum sort of stuff at home, you know, we do recycling, we do, we re- we don't have that, we, you know, we'll, we'll, but this is more of a yacht, so we will sit around and jump us in, in winter, not spending any money on electricity. Well, that's everyone, I think, right now. Um, I have a, a, a hybrid car that we, it's a, it is a petrol, it's a plug-in hybrid, so we can drive, we can, but we drive it on electric miles most of the time. I've got a, a, a charger, an, an external charger on the house, so we have, mm-hmm. we're able to charge it so that would get about 40 miles so we that reduces the amount that we spend but again i don't know upstream i don't know from us i don't know how you know energy efficient that is and also my car's made of all kinds of rare materials harvested by you know indonesian children with their their tiny hands so um from that point of view uh, i don't know i don't feel like we're a uh you know a horribly like carbon inefficient family but there's always loads more more we could do I, um, gr- uh, every year, in fact, I have a, a, this is what I'm doing this weekend. These are all my seeds for this, uh, for this year. So I grow quite a lot of stuff at, um, home, but again, that's not for any noble reason. That's because I like growing things and then going out in the garden and picking them and putting them straight in food that I'm cooking. Um, but yeah. The very no, freshest ingredients, quite literally. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I grew up in a, a very, um, uh, I would say green finger. That doesn't really green finger doesn't really cut it. My dad got an MBE for services to Chile horticulture, wow. so he's like they're, they're they're a very like yeah very gardeny family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a whole other story. Um, but the um, but yeah, so I, I held off doing it for years and years and years, and then about when we got here, I had a garden. I could actually grow stuff there for the first time in like ten years. Um, had a uh, obviously got a greenhouse, and I've got some raised beds and stuff like that. So yeah, we grow we grow bits and pieces. But no, I'm sure there are. I'm working on a number of projects for clients who are doing good things from a sustainability point of view. Like I say, I have good sustainability clients, but I myself am not particularly doing anything <laughs> much other than you know recycling. I mean, the 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 obvious thing that comes to mind. For me, there is risk uh, because this is going to kill all the businesses and all the people running the businesses. And all the people in the world, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, from a business perspective, Ooh. that's that's quite a large risk. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you would think, yeah. I, I mean, it would definitely come across your radar kind of thing. So, mm. oh, yeah. I'm you, do you, I'm do you have an approach on that front? Are you like, I mean, do you ever kind of, register with a, a client of kind of mm, you should maybe start considering these factors because yeah to a point it's not my necessarily my yeah it's not like your, your special in, the, in the level that i'm at i mean i i like i say i'm painfully aware of all because i'm a, you know I've, I've been following climate science mm. for years um 
partly as a left wing sort of person, but also I'm a, I'm a big systems theorist. So I've always been interested mm. in systems theory for 25, 30 years. Mm. It again, fits perfectly with the BA stuff and also the other stuff. Um, but the, um, so I'm painfully aware of how we're going to die, how we're all going to die and all the impact of, you know, like one or 2% uh, increase in uh, degrees, sorry, increase in temperature and the mass migrations and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, positive I, right loops. Yay. Say what I say? Positive feedback right loops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The running, running away with us. And um, I don't believe that, that it is my part from, uh, if I was to stop doing what I'm doing and begin lobbying for uh, and me and everybody else in the world was to begin lobbying that I don't believe there is, there is very much I could do mm. to help climate change, which is, might be a contentious thing. I'm sure there are. On a low level, there are things that I can do, but I am not personally the problem. Capitalism is personally the problem, be again, because capitalism. And apart from attempting to disengage on some bigger level with the system, mm -hmm. I don't know how I would make that, that bigger uh, change, that, that much of a contribution. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe, again, this is a, from a, from a personal protection point of view. Like I say, I've optimized my life where I've got work that is, so I don't wake up every night screaming that I'm not going to be able to feed my kids and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't see a way to easily detract, you know, detach myself from that without, I'm not, what am I trying to say? There are alternate lifestyles, let's say that I would consider because I am not proud and I'm not, like I say, I don't mm -hmm. care about most of the trappings of privilege. Most of the mm -hmm. stuff that I do, uh, uh, with other people is just social stuff. And then I enjoy the electronic side of stuff, but I don't, you know, it's not, that's not, again, it's not exactly the problem. I would happily have some kind of alternate lifestyle, but I don't, I'm not well off enough to, to begin one without screwing us over at the moment, if you know, so it's difficult, uh, but also I don't think it's my problem 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be Harrison Ford in Mosquito Coast, do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah. What I would ask, so I, I mean, just because you mentioned in there, like you've obviously been following it for a long time. It's something mm. that's been on your mind. You've already said, you know, you've got these, the, the sort of dark thought trigger mm. sort of thing. You must spend time deliberating on this. You must have had like big fears and worries and crises about elements of it, you know, as you read yeah. stuff and you kind of, uh, Having they, kids, how, how do you bring kids in? How could you consciously bring kids into the world when, when literally the world is in the horrifying state that it's in? Mm. Still got a kid on the way in two weeks. But it's like, you know, I don't, again, I don't, I think from a, from a, a numbers game point of view, I don't feel like my decision to have one, you know, add other kids up is, is a big contributing factor. But yeah, every time you get to that point, it's like, I worry more about what, this is the thing, emotionally be wired by having kids. When you, when you've had kids, all of your, um, your big picture fears are all wrapped in a layer of, but what are my kids going to do? Um, and I worry more about that stuff from a capitalism point of view than I do from a climate change point of view. Mm. I worry about the society getting to the point where they're going to try and again, I, I don't want to say this because I've set off some kind of like pedophile warning or thing, but I, I'm going to, I get to a point where I feel like. Uh, capitalism in society is going to try and fuck my kids um, okay. uh, over uh, to the point where um, they're not going to, they're going to be in a cycle of renting and be basically for, forever more and be totally like reliant on, you know, on, on other people's uh, handouts for the, for the rest of their life. I worry about that rightly or wrongly more than I worry about climate change because I feel like I can have a little bit more of a personal effect on that than I can on, on the big picture climate issues. But it's also something that you've seen, you know, it's something tangible. It's something that you've either seen in yeah. stories, you've seen in history, you've seen like, Which you know, that's something. Yeah. But whereas, whereas what happens next, we've got no, no, no imaginary for it really, because yeah. you know, is it, is it the worst of the 20th century with new bells and whistles or, but uh, just... so my question before we, we move on. That. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you talk about it then? Like where and when? Like do you have spaces where you do talk about it um, as a family or generally? Do you no, know? I mean just just in yourself because you know it's one of those worries that we carry around in our heads. And I'm I'm 
like part of the reason this question is in here, obviously it's a huge part mm. of this decade, but it's also where the hell do we get to speak about climate change in society? Oh yeah. Where do we get? Nowhere. So, I totally agree. And I, 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 I don't know whether or not this is me or people or, you know, people of my age or whatever, but I, um, process all this stuff myself privately. Mm. And then I, th and then I, I give out filtered versions to my friends and family. Whereas I, I think through the big, the big versions of this while secretly desperately waiting to have a conversation with people about any of this stuff, mm -hmm. but that's not just climate change. Mm -hmm. That's, um, any, anything about being, um, a man in the modern, like in the current world, mm -hmm. there are no outlets for this sort of stuff. There's no outlets to talk about other, oh, there are actually, I can't say there are no outlets, but there are less outlets to talk about being a dad. There's actually mm -hmm. less outlets to talk about being a, a uh, a left-wing business owner that there are, do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> that, that there are no outlets for this because the, and again, it's, I don't want to say, oh, this is social media or what, where this is from, but the conversation outlets where you would sit and have time, but there's no time. When do you sit and have time with people, which, which is talking time? When's the last time you sat around a dining room table with a group of people, even who were drinking or not drinking or eating and had a conversation about the world? If it was recently brilliant, you have a great set of friends and you're in plugged into that sort of a thing. All the things I do, I spend more time sitting in a room with my friend doing a, an event than I do, or sitting in a, standing in a room DJing with my friends in it and not actually getting to talk. I think there is a, a, a social, uh, what's the word? There's a, there's a whole tier of social interactions that have been lost. And I think they have been lost because of time and money and probably capitalism. And, um, because of maybe a bit social media, we've been given a release from doing it. We don't have to have those conversations anymore. Mm. I, I ran a, a night, uh, an event about, um, oh God, it was just coming out of lockdown. Actually, it was again, not hugely well attended when I kind of wish I was running it now. It's called short stories. And it was basically inviting people to come and tell personal stories on stage. Mm about anything it could be anything you want we did some mm. themed nights as well but it was like that's what it was and i came and just talked i could have talked for like this i could have talked for mm. six hours i love talking about stuff mm. and i overestimated how little other people wanted to talk, talk about themselves <laughs> but that was a night engineered for that same thing because i'm desperate to hear my friends stories but the, the the thing is they won't they won't because they think nobody cares nobody's interested and they I think they they think they're no good at telling the stories yeah. The thing is, once you get them going, once they open their mouth and they start going and then the memory kicks in and then they're like actually yeah. into saying what they're saying. Oh, and this and that and this happened and this happened. It's like, you're fascinating. Yeah, You're every, a fascinating person. Every, Why don't you share this more? Yeah. Like, because we've all done stuff in weird corners of the world while no one's yeah. watching, you know. Well, the, the, over, the, the over roots for people to do that don't, they're not there. Yeah. And that's the thing. I was trying to create a, a completely over, like, here's a place where it's fine for you to come and just talk bollocks. Talk, talk, talk about whatever you want. And a bunch of people did. And a bunch of people who I wanted to didn't. And it was like, I want to hear you. I want to hear your stories. But like, I, it, it might take a whole night of drinking with somebody before they start actually spitting out some of the interesting story. But yeah, I don't know. There's creating spaces that where it's okay. Again, this is a bit of, I don't know. I don't know, co-op safe spaces for creating space where it's safe <laughs> to, um, uh, to actually talk about things that you want to talk about. But again, the, the guy thing, and I don't want to, I, I, even when I say about, oh, you know, I'd love to be able to have conversations about what it's like being a man in the modern world. I, the reason I don't, uh, the reason I don't say that is because you immediately sound like a, you're, you're some kind of secret incel MRA guy. Mm. And I'm massively not. Mm. And, but it's like, I, I want there to be that alternate thing where I want to have a men's group where I can talk about, about this sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, that's definitely an incel society. You know what I mean? So <laughs> trying to make over versions where people can actually connect and talk about this stuff would be lovely. And it's the same with like things you are frightened of. I'd love to, I'd love to run an event where it's like, come and talk about what scares you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, like I'm thinking about, I really, I'd really like to have a conversation with people about freedom, about how they yeah. define it personally and what they think is and all that kind of stuff. 
And I think I'd like to do another one on beauty. Mm. Um, just again, because, you know, these are kind of, they're, they're ideals that are not really definable. They're very tricky, definitionally. Yeah. Um, like what does it look like to you? Yeah. And what are we actually talking about? Like, you know, we use this word interchangeably, like we all mean, you know, those words interchangeably, like we all mm. mean the same thing. Same with democracy. Like, I think that, you know, the reason we're crap at democracy is because we don't get enough practice at it. You know, to be good at <laughs> yeah. anything, you have to practice. Yeah. And, you know, people haven't done the reading, they haven't done the homework and all of that. But, um, yeah, I think practice is a big thing. Like, as much as the turmoil post-Brexit, I've always said that I love that period of time that where we had a major election every year. That was yeah. amazing. That was, <laughs> like, seriously, yeah. from a democratic standpoint, that was the most stimulating time I've ever had in this country. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Um, but... You know, most people are kind of like, oh, well, that's effort. And yeah. I don't God. know. And mm -hmm. just do that. And it's like, we need to be a bit more, you know, head up, chin up, you know, yeah. you know stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Have tell, discussions. Tell them, yeah. Let other people fill in the weak spots for you and like learn things together and share knowledge. I do, and... I do think there's a, there's a thing here. Like I say, I'm a, because I've des I, I design events and I, I run all kinds. I, I, I like a format, let's say. So I like inventing a format for a thing. I, I think I'm still trying to find a good format for that. Uh, I actually, uh, following on from the short stories thing, I actually wanted to do a, um, a talk show where you, because I did talk shows through work. Um, I, I think I've mentioned I, I did something called the Work Life Talk Show, which I'm about to bring back on on um, uh, LinkedIn. It's basically a bit top, uh, interviewing business people, but not actually still about their businesses, asking about their personal life and where they grew up. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, they were great events when, when they run them. The format was great and people were really engaged, but it was because people had come in with a, people get work events, people get business events, what they're about. It's a business event, right? It's one of the few times you're going to sit and listen to somebody talk on a topic. Because when do you, when do you do that uh, outside of work? It's not a thing you'll happily listen to somebody play music or, you know, but talks, just straight talk. I do, but I'm weird. You are weird. Yeah, that's just <laughs> true. But th and that's the thing. It's like that, that, that doing that. And then secretly, actually, it was about people's feeling thoughts and beliefs and all that sort of stuff. And mm. there was some serious kind of business land. Like, again, I don't want to talk ill of some of the people in business land, but oh my God, there's more right wing people than you can, than you, you know, you come across more right wing people. Again, this is why I've thought about a left, left leaning entrepreneur, uh, like society at some point, because it's, uh, yeah, so much to actually talk about this stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the people that you meet, it's fascinating that the, the, the scope of beliefs, because otherwise you're in your little echo chamber, your little bubble, mm -hmm. um, with your friends who broadly feel the same as you to then be forced to actually have civilized conversations with people who don't think the same as you. Mm -hmm. That was what the talk show was. And it was actually really interesting. It was like more challenging than anything I've done, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a format. I actually quite like the idea, and I'm probably going to uh, talk to you about it offline about the idea of doing your what is something to you. What does that? What does this mean mm. to you? Because mm. I think getting people to to define what they think freedom is and what they think democracy is, I think that will be fascinating. If you've never spoken about it, you don't know what you think because whatever's going on in whatever is going on in your head is a load of ass, right? Yeah, exactly. like, if it's that, not been out of your head. Yeah. It's ass, like it's just nonsense that doesn't make any sense until yeah. it's come out of your mouth and been into the real world, stood up to that minimum interrogation. Yeah. It's nothing. So you like all of the things, you know, from death to like climate change or debt or any of yeah. these things, you have to talk about them because what's yeah. in your head is not, it's not anything. No, it's just ideas you've like... inherited and mixed up. Yeah. Exactly. I don't feel like I have opinions until people ask me what they are. And I wasn't yeah. sure whether that was a me thing because I never get asked about this. But it's that thing of like, when people say to you, what do you think about that? I can answer really quickly because I'm mm. quite quick, you know, in my head, I'm pretty quick. Um, but like, normally I'm, I'm making it up on the spot. It's almost like somebody saying, what do you think about? What's your opinion on this at, you know, on the 23rd of March, <laughs> 30, 1534, it's like, well, my opinion today is this, and I absolutely will die on this rock right now. And then ask me in a couple of hours, it's like, actually, I've changed my mind a bit. It's like, suddenly it's changed. You know, it's, I honestly believe opinions, are, I agree, that opinions are things that don't exist unless you verbalize them or write them down or produce them somehow. Otherwise, it's, you're right, it's just 
Uh, it's the, the, the connectivity in your brain going round and round until somebody says, right, what are you right now? Stop. What are you? Mm. Right, okay, yeah, fine. That's what I am. It's just all that, you know, like at the seaside when you get all that foamy brown like thing yes, washing yeah, in. Discovery, yeah. it's, it's like the the social psychic equivalent of that of just brown foam washing it's just head from from the cultural consciousness cultural brown foam yeah <laughs> that's right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay so from that i'm gonna go on to uh we'll do the change question first okay because i think you'll probably have more on the ubi but i don't know we'll see um so if you could change any three things about your work I think this will be quite short because you've probably changed most of them. Yeah, and if I'm you could change any three things change. about your work, what would they be? Uh, well, the, the first thing would be, and again, this is a very capitalist thing. It's probably not, actually, but the first thing will be, um, uh, I wish people paid me how I pay people. So I, I am known for when people submit invoices, if I have the money, if the money to pay that That's invoice right, had been paid, I'd pay it within 10 seconds. I'm like, people are like, what the money is derived it's like yeah i owed you that money yeah um i don't believe in 30-day terms i have no i have no terms agreed with any business that i work with and yet they pay me 30 to 45 days some of them i have to chase and it's 90 days and it's like i don't agree that with you what excuse is there for that well no they're they're in two hour payment terms like why do you need 30 days I get told sometimes that like, oh, you know, we're only a small company to which I always say, I'm the only employee of my yeah. company. I'm smaller than you. <laughs> pay me, pay me, please. Pay me when you said you were going to do. I hate, so I hate that. I hate chasing people. I um, hate that. It's exhausting, especially um, when you're trying to run a, a, a an analysis process with somebody which needs to keep a level of energy. You have to maintain mm-hmm. it. You have to maintain positivity. Hey, the, the worst thing is like, so you're about to go into a workshop with somebody and because you're also the person who handles the finances, you have to say, so just before we start this workshop, you didn't pay the invoice you were supposed mm-hmm. to pay before this workshop started. Oh, well, I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah you're supposed to pay. Okay, no, it's, right, let's go into this workshop then. And it's like everybody's smiling. It's like you just sat there going, God, it's like, you know, I hate you and you hate me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I would probably change that. Um, yeah, what else would I, would I change? I would probably... Um, Again, from an optimization point of view, I work co- collaboratively with lots of people. I work at, at Gold Top, my other business is strictly speaking a collective. Mm-hmm. And it allows us to, not in a particularly fancy way, but we basically, we, we build teams for projects mm-hmm. uh, and we pay either evenly or on agreed terms, you know, all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I wish people would work more co- collaboratively. I wish people would work more collectively. And transparently, and usually the reason they don't want to, people don't want to work like that is because this, they've got some other better terms up the, up the chain. Mm-hmm. And that makes me a bit sad. Um, what's the thing? God, I'm really struggling for a, a third thing. I don't know. I wish we wouldn't f- each other over. That would be nice. The, the, <laughs> seriously, like we, we've been, I mean, it's a great, it's a great. One, but you know, that's, that's idealism, isn't it? I know that's <laughs> what might be out of the scope of this podcast. <laughs> sure, maybe a little I bit. think that's probably the most utopian answer. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> stop. Just be good to each other, guys. No, there's, there's, there's a, 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 ideas. Um, this is the thing. I, I, I'm quite an ideasy person. And, but then I, I, I know, and we say this. Uh, a lot with the work that we do, ideas are worthless, absolutely mm. worthless. Mm. You can be the most ideas, most creative person in the world and ideas by themselves mm. are worthless. In fact, they, 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 they cost you, they cost to get to have yeah. as you use energy to get to have them. You spend all your time thinking about them and then yeah. they don't, if, unless they are enabled in some way and that you're great, if you can enable yourself to do stuff. Mm. And I, and I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at the having an idea and then going, right. Was a version of that I can do for no money and no risk, um, and just make it happen, you know. So there's there's a there's a bit of that, but um, the this still doesn't mean it's okay for other people who are ena- able to enable an idea to steal it. Somebody's better positioned is not acceptable, and I've had that happen uh, a number of times in in business and in other stuff. It's like, yeah, you can do a great job. I I have never stolen an idea from anybody else i have done things that are, that are similar to other people but that's because it's not they were doing them anyway do you know what yeah. i mean like, uh, 
it's not like they didn't own the, there was no patents on the, on the idea and it wasn't, I wasn't doing it in a confrontational way or, a, you know, most of the time they made money from the thing they were doing and I didn't, um, cause that's like, most of the time you don't need somebody else's idea, do you? It's, it's, yeah, there's it's, enough, there's enough. Most of us can come well, up with well, ideas. <laughs> People's tendency when you tell them an idea is actually not to look at the idea. Their their tendency is to map it to an idea they had. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of like, okay, right, right. Guess, but I, I'm not going to do it your way because the thing I'm doing is genuinely either sl- majorly or subtly different. Or but look to slap it down straight away of just like, ah, oh, that'll, that'll never work. That's yeah, that's not a thing, yeah. <laughs> I, I, making it, making some, doing something that is, your own way of doing something for the sake of doing it because you because it's the it's praxis isn't it well it's praxis mm. like you're actually doing it for this the, the doing is the thing not the thinking it's the it's the, the doing is the actual thing and i spent years having ideas as a kind of i used to call it it's like it's like mental masturbation having having ideas in that it's like some people, um, I would spend hours in rooms with people saying, oh, I've had this, uh, what, wouldn't it be great if we did this? And there'd be people that would go, oh my God, this, that is brilliant. So it would work like this. And like, yeah, yeah, that's how it would work. And then there'd be this other thing on the side and it would, it would interact in this way. And then, oh my God. And it'd be monetized this way and everybody gets super excited. And we talk about it for an hour and then look, several people and go, right, we're going to do it. And I'm like, what are you still talking about that? And it's like, because my, the, the act of talking through the idea was the relief that I wanted. That was like the, the personal relief that I wanted from that. And I do, I, actually doing the thing, it's like, yeah, that sounds like a lot of work. Mm. And that was, my, that was my thing. Whereas now I'm more likely to have an idea. I have so many things, that ideas go through that the ones that I actually take forward are the ones I really want to do. The ones after, and they go through that process of like, yeah, I'd have done it. If I wanted to do it enough, I'd have done it already. I mean, uh, and loads of that, it's just time, isn't it? It's just, mm-hmm. you know, getting used to yourself, getting used to like what you do, what you're willing to do, like how much time you would actually put in all those kind of things. Yeah. And, and they, and being able to enable stuff as well. And this is the, the good thing about having a bit more money in the pot and running stuff through the business means I can enable things. If the only difference is like a piece of kit is required to run an event piece of kit plus, plus a bit more of my time, mm. then that means it's within my, completely within my power to make it happen. So I can save up and buy the kit and I can put my, put the time and energy in and it gets harder and harder as I get older and fatter. But at the same time, it's like, I can still make it happen. So that the nights I'm running at Cellar at the moment, there was a, a, the different style bands that normally play at Cellar, which is a small venue. But I knew I could enable that night by basically ha- having my own PA at the front and bringing my own monitors and cables and everything else, mm. and then moving stuff around. But that means I have to go down at four o'clock yeah. on a Sunday yeah. and spend an hour and a half setting up and doing my own sound to then basically start doing an hour of DJing, two hours of bands, an hour of DJ, mm. and then it's midnight on a. So this is on a Sunday. It's midnight on a Monday, and I'm at McDonald's in in Leeds having a having a burger because I'm dying, and I'm in bed at one and mm. you know, and then I'm at work at half seven. Mm. So, but it's all within my power. What it enables is I can do a night. I couldn't do it. You know, it, it, it's not prevented by anything other than my own self-management. So yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, so that's the change question. So, uh, UBI. So yes. I, I mean, have you even ever had it? I, cause you've already mentioned it within the conversation. Mm. So. I know you're familiar with it. Um, <laughs> have you ever had a conversation with anyone about UBI? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, it was a conversation t- towards the, well, we almost got it from because of COVID. Mm. The change in circumstances that were brought about by COVID almost necessitated the, a, a proto uh, I think, UBI. I think they have. I think they have. Full start. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything that anyone can do now beyond, like, because if we're not going to go through a program of, you know, radical depopulation from mm. above, yeah. um, which it seems we are practically doing at the moment. Mm. Uh, but outside of that, people need money in their, in their hands. And, and you yeah. know, the whole sort of, if you take the, the, what they said about the bailouts in 2008 at the time, if you take that seriously, not that I ever mm. would, but if you do, um, you know, the, the the whole reason of that bailout was to get money back into the high street, you know, was to trickle down through the banks. Mm. And 
it didn't work, you know, and no, we had all the money printing money. to stop inflation and so on. It's like people is people things are getting worse for people, multiple. Um, so we need to do something if we are going yeah, to Yeah, something I believe something will trigger it. And I don't and I believe that something will be either another pandemic or climate change or a global financial not necessarily a collapse, but a global financial massive restructure. Or and, uh, or a you know Ukrainian ISIS or whatever, like yeah, allow them to something else. Or... Exactly, and I don't, I don't believe. Uh, again, I don't want to seem cynical here, but I don't believe that. I believe that there are multiple versions of what that looks looked like. There's a there's a version that's actually fantastic and super enabling for people to do what they want to do, and there's a version that's another way for capitalism, another version of capitalism to fuck you mm. and keep you in a small place. And um, that's not to say I don't believe in it because I absolutely want to just believe in it in, in uh, universal basic income. I absolutely think it should be a thing. I think it should be a thing now. Mm. Um, the, 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 the thing that, that is always in my mind is the, the lack of association between work and jobs. So if you, and I saw this more than anything when I was in during, uh, lockdown, looking at my little village community that I'm, that I'm living in, there are. Uh, a thousand, uh, a million tasks that could be done by people, but the reason they're not doing them is because there's no job attached to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, improving the stuff that's going on to improve parks uh, that, that we've got here. Um, there's also, um, the, you know, all these opportunities to take dead land and convert it into growing spaces and things like that. Mm. That's a task. That's a piece that's work that, that could be done and would directly benefit people. But capitalism has not attached a job to it. Mm. That's the that's the issue. So the the problem is the best version of of uh, universal basic income would be that it detaches money and uh, and jobs from work, mm. because there's always things that have a value, and that value can actually be quantified. It can be a social value, or it could be a personal value, or it could be a value to your community. And um, of all the things that need doing, and again that. Cap capitalist people will be like, great, let's get people litter picking for their, for their money. And it's like, you're taking- That's some... not the point of it. Yeah. But you're taking something that's actually would be of a value to, the, to society and making yeah. it a bad thing. Because yeah. actually, the world really needs people to go around and pick up all the shitty litter of the previous mm -hmm. generations, including myself, uh, put that apart everywhere. So that's the thing. That's the thing for me. It's that just, if, if there's a version that allows people to do to, to work without a job, mm. that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm. That's the version that I don't see happening, sadly, mm. because that's the version where people get to define amongst themselves. And this sounds like terribly like communism. Um, people get to define um, think the value of things outside of the value to their global financial system. Mm. Because actually there's a million things, like I say, that need doing and a million ways to help people in your community and help you know, and build interesting things and better things and to do things that don't actually have any, like there's an argument around where art lives. If you have a, a universal basic income, because mm -hmm. it's not really, you know, it's not it, value of it is much more difficult to quantify mm -hmm. than say, oh, hey, why don't you build a community orchard or community, you know, like something like that. And that's the bit that's on the side. I think it becomes more valuable though. I think it becomes more valuable because You've got more people buying into it, I think, because more people will do it and more people will get better at it and practice. And, and so it would be fantastic. I think. Yeah, I know. This is not, by the way, this is not me not saying that I see the value of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying from a from a when you're comparing it, there's still going to be some bottom level comparison about the and what people do for that for that money, mm -hmm. and that's the bit that unless people break the 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 thing of it being for that money, because that's what's always going to be. You know, we, we've had. 200, year, 200 years of things being, it's, of work being for money. You know, we've yeah. had a thousand years of work being for money and actually yeah. work, work not being for money equals, you know, slash job. Mm -hmm. if that's the thing that would have to be broken. That's the bit that I don't know about. I mean, the other, the other side of that as well, uh, I, we'll, we'll come back to sort of you Ooh. more specifically in a bit, but, um, like the, the connection between work and money is broken. Because mm. you don't make any money by working. The yeah. only way you can get ahead now is to own assets. 
if you don't own any assets, you you are going nowhere except yes. into the street. So we've already broken that connection between work and money. Because, I agree with you, but the, you it's know. the jobs thing. This is the thing. It's like jobs are the quanta by which the yeah. government recognizes money. You have a job and a job has a, has a tax pay, uh, you know, pay associated with it. Mm. So the, I believe that the, the work and, and money via jobs is broken. But I think that that connection between um, work for the sake of it being, you know, there's so, there's so much work to be done, mm -hmm. but there's not jobs for it. That's the bit that, that is, is difficult to break because if you're not, unless people start allowing people to create jobs that have no money, but that contribute, that are allowed by universal ba basic income, that's the bit that, that scares me. I don't think people are going to allow that to happen. And actually, as a result, community and society is not actually going to improve because of universal basic income, but some people will be on the dole through another meet by, you know, with another hat on. That's, that's the thing. And I don't, and I, I don't, you know, again, this is not to say that I've, I've been, you know, on the dole, I've been on the sick and it's not, you know, it's, again, I don't mind people being in that situation. I don't care. I'm happy for my taxpayer money to go towards that, but it's my taxpayer money. Yeah, and that's but... the thing. It's like when, when that gets repointed towards people doing what they think is the right thing to do or what, just what they want to do. That's the thing that sh that I actually believe should happen, but I don't believe ever will. Because mm. heaven forbid, people should actually be empowered and yeah, and, and... yeah, exactly. <laughs> another another way to fuck you. That's the thing. Yeah, another way, another <laughs> secret way for capitalism to uh, yeah, to fuck you. I I mean, with that question, generally, it kind of boils down to: Would you still work? I mean, would you would you? Well, I get yeah, I get the impression the things that you're doing at this point you're doing them because you enjoy them and like and anything that you didn't want to do you would drop. Yeah, to, no, no, yeah, that would that's the golden version of me. That's right. the utopian version of me. Yeah, yeah. The reality is I work because I need money. Yeah, I have um, quite a lot of debt from uh, a, a business that I ran before that failed just after we'd taken investment into the business to grow the business and then it failed and left us with the personally liable debt. Um, that was on it. So, and I haven't got savings and I haven't got any of those things. I haven't got a safety net. And that's the point where I'm at. All the money that we have is, is in the house. Um, we, you know, we pay for it. We, we lease a car, all those things. I haven't got any of those things. So I can't drop anything. Um, I'm just very good at making stuff work around that. Um, if I was flattened, not personally, like if I, if, if that situation was, was flattened, yeah, I'd, I'd go and do more of the things. I'd go and actually do, I'd, I'd use the, the things that I've got, which are skill and they are valuable, but I'd use them to go do other things that I'm doing. Now I'd, I'd pick and choose, yeah, I'd be able to pick and choose what projects I worked on. Whereas yeah. right now I can't, I can pick and choose because I'm lucky because I've got a volume of things to choose from. And there's a lot of different people. I only work with people I like. That's a bottom line. And that's, again, is about very lucky to only work with people. Like I walk away from clients with what I don't like, mm -hmm. um, but I don't also get to pick the, I'm not, I'm not wealthy enough or set and sorted enough to be able to pick what I work on, what types of projects I work on. But I don't work with like giant oil companies, things like that. But yeah, aside from that, I, I'm not, I'm not there. Mm. Okay. Uh, do we have anything else to say on UBI? No, I wish, I, I wish it was a, I wish it was a thing. Yeah. Well, I, I do think it will be. And, and I'm, I, 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 I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but I think I, I have been persuaded by the argument that we, we're not going to get anything that's coming from the left. The only way that any of these things are coming in will be from the right. And it will be because they have to do it. Yeah. I, I kind of agree. I, I, that's a whole other, the, the effectiveness of the left is a whole other conversation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I've kind of run over. Apologies, That's you right. don't have to dash off anywhere, do you? No, no, I'm all okay. okay. So uh, this is the section. I'll throw it over to you. So if there's anything that we haven't touched on that you wanted to uh, talk about or anything that you want to kind of revisit, uh, yeah, anything you want to say, over to you. God, it's difficult. Um... I mean, you can just plug the, the various socials and stuff if you want. Well, all the things, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I should probably do that. I don't know. I, I don't know from a, let's say from a, from a things that we, topics we have not covered point of view. I think we've covered most of the things that I would. It's talk. pretty comprehensive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a fair, a fair tunnel. Um, 
Well, yeah, the, so yeah, like I say, to, to escape from most of that stuff, um, I um, I do uh, events. So um, in terms of the different types of events at the moment that I'm doing, most of the stuff I'm doing is under not a thing. So yeah, you can find that on Instagram, not a thing events. Um, I do put yourself out there, which is a night of uh, contemporary jazz, fusion, R&B, neo soul, uh, all that sort of stuff that's currently at Celebar and from next September will be at Celebar and Hyde Park Book Club. Um, Celebar monthly at Hyde Park Book Club every other month. Um, I do a thing called Tap Room Collectors Club, which is uh, if you like craft beer and you like tap rooms, we tour around going to nice rooms up and down the country, especially the local ones when they open because they're really easy to get to. But um, I do that. I do a night called Risk of Us, which is Risk of Us, which is basically it's a sing along music night where uh, people pick songs they want to pick, they want to sing in advance on a theme. Mm -hmm. And um, they we project their lyrics on the wall and they sing the verse and everybody sings the chorus. So it's like a big whole involved sing along thing, which is really fun, mm -hmm. like an uh, anthemic thing. That's a proper community as well. Like, uh, we have quirky versions of songs and kind of people, I say this because people expect it to be like a covers band and it's, it's really. Um, there's a spin-off night from that called Album Covers, which is the same thing, but we cover an album back to back. So when, you know, start to finish track by track, um, and that's all voted for which track, which albums we do and everything else. So we did, this was last weekend, we did, uh, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill album, which was quite, which was fun. And sometimes around the time again, and that same same thing again, sing along, uh, sing along time. But actually, I should say the risk of us, the next risk of us that we're doing, the the theme for it is because we pick random themes. We uh, I thought it would be fun to do uh, a, a, a tracks from a particular now album. Mm -hmm. So we picked an album, uh, a number between one and forty, and that's the now album that we a random number between one and forty, and that's the now <laughs> album that we're doing the songs from. So we're doing now twenty nine. Um, uh, the next one, God, what else do I do? I do an online music video night called a MTV. That's a bit like an old school MTV. What watch along, but we played new music videos and things like that. Anything that has a YouTube, um, link. I do the, the, uh, fortnightly DJing, uh, DJ mixers on as fresh out the watch, which is on Mixcloud and on YouTube. But if you follow me on, um, Instagram, I press post about those as well. What else do I do? Probably most of the things I think at the moment. Um, I do other kind of in between DJ nights, but they're not. They're usually just like bar DJing, so less. Um, like the fresh out of the what stuff is more proper house DJing with like I've got proper set a proper setup and stuff. The bar DJ is just relaxed, like cafe bar type uh, type DJ. Um, probably probably enough things. Um, yeah, that's yeah, all that, the things. That's all the things, yeah. It's quite a lot of things, yeah. The whole point of not a thing, though, that the reason it's called not a thing is because I tended to do an, an event format that wasn't previously a thing. So nine, ten years ago, I did a, a when I was working for the agency, I started doing some interactive business analysis events. So basically, standing up in front of a of a whiteboard and doing things, random things, and I decided to do the periodic table of chocolate. So we basically we bought all of the types of chocolate that there are in a petrol station. And we um, could cut them up and distribute them for about 60 people in a, in a room. And people had to vote where they would be on a periodic table based on two factors. And we did it in real time on a, white, on a digital whiteboard, kind of moving stuff, stuff around. So I did all that. And then I did the periodic table of cheese. And the periodic table of cheese was, I did 50 cheeses in one night. Um, and then we did it again, we did another 50 cheeses and then another 50 cheeses. So we basically ended up tasting 150 types of cheese. Um, and then I did, created a game show version of that and took that on the road up and down the, the country, went to loads of places and did, did that for a, a couple of years. Um, so, and then, uh, then I did the period of table of sausage that was good as well. Uh, that was like dry sausage and, and like cooked sausage and all this stuff. So, and this is what I mean, like as a, as a, as a format. Wasn't a, there isn't anything else that's like you stand and you, you whiteboard stuff out in, in real time. That's not a thing. That's why the thing is not a thing. Cause it's like, it's like, is this a thing? Well, no, not before, but no, it is. That's the idea. So I like, I like ideas that are, it's a thing. So, mm. That's what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's probably, really most of the stuff. And if you ever need any business analysis, 
I am the I am the guy. I am the, I am. <laughs> we started remembering to sell my work, uh, my work stuff. Thank you again to Dan for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests, and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And listener, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for using the passive voice on you. You're not passive. You're active. I've been treating you all wrong. You are contributors, not consumers. Listening is active, not passive consumption. As a listener to this podcast, you know I want working hours to not just be content. Firstly, I know real things have happened because of this podcast, and I recognise that if you've been listening long term, you're aware of that too. Working hours is snapshots and scrapbook posts, but I want both you and I to stay aware of the intentional and unintentional patterns in this collection. I want you to stay mindful that this collection is purely made up from those generous people who have taken part, been interviewed, listened to their interviews, and shared their episodes. In some cases, they've even listened to their episodes. It's not easy to listen to yourself, but I like to think that that part of this project is a real opportunity. It's a chance to reflect once again, not only on yourself and your work, but also on your own self-marketing and branding. Working hours may touch on your personal political opinions and lifestyle choices, but on the whole, it looks to consider both the general and particular lived professional and economic realities of our time. When we're recording an interview, it's just me and guests having a nice little chat, but that becomes something more brutal as it becomes a podcast. My rantings and some of my conversation are all well and good in a small group, but when different people come into our discussion, it necessarily changes our context. And a change in context needs some changes in behavior. I couldn't tell you how many interviewees know much or anything of working hours when they actually record. I don't know how many of my guests have ever actually listened to even their own episode, let alone other episodes. The only information that I have about working hours is what I have done for it. And I can't remember most of that at this point. Remember, all my guests get to listen to and feedback on what they've said in their recording before I make their episodes up. So far, they haven't had any editorial input into how I make their episodes, outside of saying, take out this or that bit. When I make their episodes, I make some cuts to dialogue, and I try to clean up the audio as best I can with whatever raw files I have from the basic equipment and the basic audio engineering knowledge that I have managed to glean by doing this. When I edit and build episodes, I always try to keep them as close as possible to what my guests have actually said. For the episodes I make, I want them to agitate, educate and organise. I want them to entertain, educate and inform. I also want to get to know some people in my own hometown to do stuff and things with. I'd love to make loads of money out of this or anything and be greatly loved and celebrated and be held tight and told everything is okay and also be remembered forever as a great and just person who never did anything wrong. We're all still allowed to dream, aren't we? I should probably check that, as it seems unlikely that would still be allowed. It could lead to smiling or other crimes of unauthorised expression. Outside of delusion, the reality is that I am incredibly lucky to get anyone for this podcast. None of us know what we're really getting ourselves into whenever we take on anything new. My guests are taking a leap of faith on me, and I'm also taking a huge leap of faith doing this. All of that, indeed anything, is much harder for anyone when everything around them is just so utterly terrible. From cost of living to the closeness of the nuclear threat to ongoing and ever-growing economic and social upheaval alongside 45 degrees centigrade temperatures appearing regularly around the world and more and more wars and disasters popping up everywhere. I don't mean to dwell on the negative, but I can't pretend those things aren't happening and don't affect me and what I'm able to do. I neither live nor work in perfect conditions and no one ever really has. If you have enjoyed this episode of Working Hours or you hated this episode, either remember to, or even just unthinkingly, share it with your networks. Make sure to tag at Working Hours Pod Leads in your posts about the podcast. Especially do so if it made you outraged in some way, for some reason, because that's how to get attention quickly 
And it's actually really good because attention needs money. And I need money. I need all the money or a UBI. If you want to be on working hours, you should be either in Leeds or from Leeds. And you don't have to be in work to be on working hours. Send an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com to get involved or give feedback on episodes of Working Hours. Or if you'd like to make an anonymous appearance in the Working Hours podcast, email westernstudios at protonmail.com. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. And or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month for loiners there's also an outlander tier at five pound a month for non-loiners and a 12 pound a month big time tier for anyone who's flash if you're happy to make a regular contribution but you're priced out by a pound a month you can go to libra pay that's l-i-b-e-r-a-p-a-y dot com forward slash western studios forward slash donate and donate from as little as a penny a week all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibrePay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember that the first series of Working Hours is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com forward slash at Working Hours Podcast 4618. More episodes will be going up irregularly and they should all be available there soon. Use the hashtag WorkingHoursPodLeads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. The goal of the money and social media is supposedly to make Working Hours and my commitment to it both possible and sustained. To improve the curation of my episodes and interviews. It feels more like a time suck than any kind of investment though. I believe the point of Working Hours is to showcase leads, to promote the ongoing dialogue in my city about work, society and climate action both in the future and right here in the present. I want this show to become history. I want there to be a future in order for that to happen. Something which I have little to no faith in actually happening. I want working hours to be a way for loiners to appreciate what's on their doorstep and what history is in their families and buried under their streets today. I want working hours to show the breadth of work and the possible careers loiners can and do do. I want to tell people how to get paid, to encourage them to start businesses and support them when they do. I want workers to know their rights and how to fight to defend them and expand them. I want unions to make themselves truly relevant again. I want to promote local businesses and highlight why others should invest in Leeds. And I want to show how loiners get everywhere, all over the world. I want all loiners to know we are all over the world and we're from all over the world. And that we have been that way for surprisingly longer than you might have thought. Not only that, I want those that didn't know that Leeds has and continues to be at the centre of world-changing, engineering, inventions, scientific breakthroughs, political and pop culture moments. I want those that do know that to come and tell me what they know about it. Wherever you live is amazing. It's impossible and unbelievable. And it's precious and it's fragile, but it's also able to be resilient and strong to propagate and to continue. Well, I live in Leeds and we can, have, will and do, do anything and everything. I want to celebrate that here and I want to promote it to others elsewhere. So please help me to find the guests, reach the audience and to access different and more offline based workers to come and be guests and contributors to working hours. Any Leeds business or profession is requested to be and allowed to be on. And anyone, non-business and non-professional, you do work you don't get paid for, tell me about it. Behind the paywall, I will, and already do, have some other episodes and bonus material. Come interact with me there and let's talk Leeds, climate action and how we're going to get that UBI. We can talk about the shape of working hours, what should be leaned into and what should be dialed back. Should I do some short cut versions of interviews for the free podcast and then put the long cuts behind the paywall? Will it profit me to do that and incentivize me to do that bit more? Perhaps. 
I'm amazed I haven't had one driving job on yet. Not one cab driver, bus driver, truck driver, or even a driver's mate. There are no posties on here. No nurses, no teachers, no plumbers, no shelf stackers or security guards, no contractors or traders, no wheelers or dealers, no actual government agencies, no gardeners, no milkmen or milkmaids. A lot of road works in Leeds, but no road workers on here. We have an airport and an airline, but they're not on here. We have major government branches, not on here. All the call centres, not on here. We have major bank branches and hubs, but not so much on here. We have huge logistics companies, but not on here. We have a national commercial soap opera filmed here, but nothing about it on here. We have the largest indoor market in Europe, but not one person from it on here. We are the birthplace of Marks and Spencers, Asda and Burton's, but no one from these brands are on here. And finally, I've decided that politically, I will have any councillors or local worker of any party on working hours if they wish to take part, but not MPs, except for my MP. I will be willing to interview my MP, whatever party they are from, should they wish to take part over the course of working hours. I won't invite them on directly. So this also includes if I move to a different constituency. Other than that, MPs are in no. With regards to any media that I will do, I will not appear in any regional or national legacy media interviews, but any loiners working at such entities are more than welcome to record for this podcast, should they wish to do so. I want to try to be ruthless with systems and to be kind to individuals. Hold me to that, please. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. OK, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there. And be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain, and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Western Studios Leeds can help you realize your podcast for only £25 for an hour of podcast work. Need podcast production, recording, editing, or any podcast admin doing? Need it all doing? Or maybe you want or need a podcast presenter or co-presenter for your podcast project. For only £50 per hour, I'm more than happy to take that on for you. Email makemypodcast at western-studios.com to get your podcast made. I am available to third sector organisations, small to medium-sized businesses, and individuals who want to make podcasts or other digital audio content. Want to make some fundraising case studies? Want to show off your expertise in your field? Want some help creating your podcast and format, or just some support learning to podcast and getting going? Whatever your podcast question or need, get in touch with Western Studios Leads. Go to westernstudios.com and use the contact page to drop me a message about either working hours or about your own podcast project.